So thank the Lord for that. This morning, I want to talk about something because I've, I've been aware of this for a while, and you've been hearing me say this for a while. And, uh, but, it, but it's almost at a critical stage for our church, I mean, for our Assemblies of God, for the church in general. I'm, ta- I'm not talking just this church, but the church in general. In America, maybe it's worldwide, but I know it's in America. <clears throat> for all kinds of reasons. I mean, I, I could go over the reasons. That's not, that's not my premise today to go over the reasons. But there is a dearth, and I do mean dearth, of ministers today in the Assemblies of God. We don't have enough ministers for the openings that are there without even creating. We want to we start new churches, the Assemblies of God, and there's not ministers to fill what we have. Also, when you call and you find out, there's not youth pastors. And that doesn't mean there isn't one here or there, but overall, there's just not. And we call our Bible col- uh, colleges. There's not children's, children's pastors. You, you, if, if you find one, he has 20 offers, or she has 20 offers. There's just not enough. You call about worship leaders, so on. Good luck is what they tell you. Good luck. I'm, I'm not kidding. They say good luck because have, we, have we have 20 in front of you looking for one, 15 looking for one, whatever. And it doesn't mean there isn't a few around, but overall those few are, are there's many spots and so on. So why is that happening? There's all kinds of reasons why. But I know this more than ever, that scripture that I've always, we've all heard many times, read many times, is now lo- looming large for the Assemblies of God. It is for everybody else, too. But I'm just saying for the Assemblies of God, I can speak for for sure. Jesus said, pray. The harvest is ready. But pray that laborers would be sent out. That God, the Lord of the harvest, would send out laborers. Now, here's the thing. So I asked myself the question, okay, God, are you not speaking and sending out laborers? Do you not want laborers? Well, sure he wants laborers. That's, that's, a, that's almost like a, a no-brainer. He wants laborers in his vineyard then why aren't there laborers? It's one of two things. People either aren't hearing or they're hearing and saying, I don't want any part of that. Because for whatever reason, for all kinds of reasons. Or does he want the church to do more, the church in general, you and I, to do more of that? And not, it's not so much the professionalism, if I can put it that way. Hire the professional. Yeah. I want you to do it the way the old-fashioned way, the New Testament way maybe. I don't know the answer to it, but I know this. We need to pray to the Lord of Harvest that he send forth laborers, whether it's from the congregation, whether it's from the uh, the Bible schools, because right now it's not working. One of the things that goes through my head, think about this. I I don't believe people are hearing the call. That's just my opinion. It may may be totally wrong. I don't think it's wrong, but it's not the only answer. And because it doesn't seem like young people are saying, I know God showed me I want to be involved in this and that. I want to be involved in this. We don't have as many. Many are going to Bible school, but they're becoming out as teachers, and that's okay. They're going to liberal arts, that's okay, but they're not going into ministry, or at least into a full-time ministry. So we got to pray for, har- for laborers. We need laborers. But in the meantime, I believe also God is saying, I, w- I want you to go back to the Old Testament method. Renew my witness in this place. Everyone today, I want us to think about that. Renew my witness. Renew your witness. Renew our witness. It's important, I think, let's read it's, uh, it's, uh, Romans 12, 2, and we'll go to 1 John 1, 3. Paul's saying here, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our mind, my mind, our mind needs to be renewed. That you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 John. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us and And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Christ Jesus. Let's look at two other verses here. Before before we do it, I'm just going to make a statement in Matthew and also in Acts 1.8. Jesus, you always talk about somebody's first words when they're um, maybe a man in business or whatever, or a woman in business, what have you. Somebody's first words you remember when you first meet them. And you also might remember their last words. I want us to see what Jesus told us. His first, some of his first words to us, and also his last words. Let's look at uh, Matthew four nineteen, and he said, meaning Jesus, unto them, "Follow me." And th- that could be put out to every one of us. If we were all by the river seashore, he would have said, "Follow me, just follow me." And what will I do? He said, "I will make you fishers of men." In other words, witnesses for me. 
I, I will teach you to evangelize. I will teach you to be witnesses for me. That was, his, that was some of his first words to the church, his disciples, his disciples to be, and so on. Let's go to the next one, Acts 1 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And what's that for? And ye shall be my witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Here's a side note. This is just the way I think. This is some of Jesus' last words. Now, he told us first, I want you to be, I want you to witness for me. Then he said, I'm going to send you back a comforter it's going to, and, and you're going to be full of power to do what? To be witnesses. Not just to live your life as a Christian, but to be witnesses unto me all over the place. Like we could just say right now, Scranton, you know, I don't know, Nicholson, uh, Wilkes-Barre, uh, whatever, Glenburn, whatever. You know, put those little towns there. Put those little towns in there, what have you. Towns and cities in there. He wants us to be his witness. So he said at the very beginning, it's like the bookend. And he said it at the end. In the middle, he showed us how to do that. He wants us to be his witnesses. I believe personally, and I, I know every pastor in the Assemblies of God talks about this. The importance of the Holy Spirit is not communicated as strongly as it used to be. And I don't know that anybody means that. Not that I don't think anybody means bad by that or evil by that. But we just haven't communicated. Like once a year, we'll talk on Pentecost Sunday for the most part. And we'll occasionally give uh, some time towards the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and so on. But overall, myself included, I'm not talking anybody down. I'm talking, we kind of gloss over it for the most part. Not meaning anything evil by it. But I wonder if we're not receiving the ramifications of forgetting about that verse. We need the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost. This church needs the Holy Spirit. Why? So we can be witnesses. Not just to be Christians. He wants us to be witnesses. If there's a difference between being a Christian, being a Christian is good, but the best is to be a witness. He wants us to be a Christian witness for him. And, and he gives the Holy Spirit, not just for me to stay a Christian, he gives the Holy Spirit for me to be a witness and for you to be a witness for us, whether, whether you're the, the, the professional, so to speak, out of Bible school or whether we're the average person in the pew, we're all the same. He wants us to be witnesses. And I'm wondering if maybe because of our not stressing it as much as we used to, because that's how we were birthed in the move of the Holy Spirit. By not stressing that, if maybe, just maybe, we don't have the workers that we did, because, and, we're not, and we're not witnessing like we did. That's just a thought of mine. But Jesus wants us to witness. That's his first words to all of us. <coughs> He, it's today, he wants us, I think every one of us here, we're called to be his witness. That's, you're called, I'm called, we're all called to witness. Lord, renew my witness. Jesus used many terms to call you and I, the church. When he was on the earth, he called you and I. He said, you're the salt of the earth. We talked about that a few weeks ago. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. He says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Give the keys to the kingdom. He also looked at himself and called himself the bread. Called himself the water and so on. He said, my kingdom is like leaven and so on. Um, he said, I'm come to send fire on the earth and whatever. What are all of those things have in common? You know, being salt, being light, being, you know, the leaven, being water, being bread and so on. They all have penetration capabilities. They're all called to penetrate. Each one of those represents some type of penetration. Meaning God wants us to penetrate this society. He wants us to penetrate, not just to be in it, but to penetrate it for the good. You see, salt penetrates meat and preserves it. And other things, but especially me preserves it. Light penetrates darkness and dispels the darkness. Keys penetrate a lock and open, open, opens the key, uh, the lock, and of course it opens a new world or what have you. Bread penetrates, you know, that penetrates the uh, uh, the body for nourishment for our body, spiritual or natural. Water penetrates the earth for moisture. Leaven penetrates the dough to make it rise, and so on. It's important. And uh, fire has a penetrating quality. And that fire uh, will, will, will continue as long as it has new fuel, but if it has no fuel, then it will, it will be distinguished and so on. Yes. We are to penetrate. We are to penetrate. We're called to be Christ's penetrating power on the earth. That's what the Holy Spirit was giving. We're to be a witness to every person, go into all the world, not just live there, said, and preach the good news. We're to go into all the world and share the good news. Every one of us, whether we go to Bible school or whether we never go to Bible school, it doesn't matter. We're all called. We're all to be his penetrating power in the world. The church exists, there's many purposes for the church. 
But I do believe because Jesus said that at the very beginning, we're called to be witnesses. I'll make you witnesses, and over here, I want you to be my witness, and so on. I'll send you the Holy Spirit so that he'll empower you, and so on. He wants us to be his witness. The number one reason for the church to exist, there's a lot of reasons for the church to exist. And and they all have their place. But the number one reason to exist is to be a witness, is for the church to be a witness, in-house, but mainly out-house. If we don't witness, there's not much reason for the church to exist. Everything else is secondary. Jesus, he, that's why he gave the bookends. He said, everything else is inside of here, but I want you to know, I'm going to teach you to witness, and I'm sending you the power to be my witness. We are called to witness for him. We're called to be his witnesses, and so on. It's, it's important that we do that. And I know a lot of times people think, oh, okay, you know, witnessing ex- exists. Uh, you know, that means going door to door. That means, um, you know, have, reading this three, five, ten spiritual halls and so on and so forth, reading all that, and, uh, uh, you know, asking people where they're going to heaven or hell, things like that. That all has its place. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, and people will be doing that. People are doing that. And that's a good thing. But I believe there's, a, there's a, a, a far greater way to witness. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We should do that. I believe Jesus, and I want to, uh, again, read 1 John 1, 3. 1 John 1, 3, this is how we're supposed to witness. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. It's important that everyone in this room, if you've not had an a, a experience with God that he's declared things to you and, and you've seen some things, you need to say, God, I need that. Because I can't speak anything that I have not experienced. The scripture tells us you overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. A testimony means you have something to share. You've been, God shared something with you. You you heard something from God. You saw something from God. You're declaring what you saw. The disciples are saying, we're declaring what we've seen. If you don't, it's just theory. It's just theory. It's in theory only. That you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. God wants us to declare what he's done for us where we're at. The greatest witness that you can do is saying, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Because when you share what Jesus did for me, that person has to go, I have to call you a liar. I don't want to do that because we're friends or whatever. I may not like what you're saying, but I have to at least, hmm. Or I can still uh, turn it away, but it is his theory now. It's not just, that's just your way. No, it's what he did for me. And he'll do the same for you. That's why he says comfort one another with the same comfort you've been comforted with. You need to have an experience with God that changes who you are, not in theory only. There's so many times when I, I'll share testimonies of what God has done in our life with us, and people will say, I can hardly believe that, even Christians. And I say, that's sad, because you should have the same experience. You should have the same ex- type, ex- I mean exactly the same, the same type, because God wants, because that's what we speak from. When you know that you know that you know, you'll be the best, I hate to use the word salesperson, but I'm going to say that for a moment. To be the best spokesperson is a better word. For Jesus Christ. It's kind of like any salesperson in the world can sell. If he likes to sell cars, he'll sell Fords, Chevys, Toyotas, Dodges, whatever, and he'll sell them because he wants to make a living. But there's nothing like a salesperson who's owned Fords or Chevys or whatever it is, Fiat, whatever he is, and, he's, and he knows they're good because he's experienced they've got 250,000 miles on them without, tra- without having to change a transmission, without having to do much work to it. And he's done, he says, I know these are good cars because I've driven them for 20 years, 20, and man, these cars work, and they work, and they work, and they get great gas mileage, or whatever, whatever he's promoting, because he's experienced that car, he's known inside out, he knows how it works, and so on, so he shares what has happened in his life, and he's going to try to sell you that car, even when you say, no, I'm telling you, you're making a mistake, sir, this is going to be the best, it might cost a couple bucks more, but it's the best car you'll ever own, that's what God wants us to have with Jesus, many people have, in today's society, have accepted Christ as Savior, but they've not experienced the Savior, They've not experienced the fellowship with God. He wants us to have fellowship, communion with the Holy Spirit. That change, that makes you know that you know that you know. Think about Samuel. When Samuel first, the the story about Samuel goes when when he was a young boy, a little boy, young boy, the voice of God was speaking to him audibly. And Samuel would go to Eli, the the priest. What are you you calling me for? And he said, I'm not calling you. He did it three times. So finally, the third time, Eli said, next time, say, Lord, Speak to me. You know, it's the Lord speaking to you. So just say, Lord, here am I. Speak to me. And, of course, we know Samuel heard the voice of God. And God even pronounced the judgment on Eli anyhow, and, his, and his boys at that time. And so but Samuel heard the voice of God. From that point on, Samuel knew the voice of God. I'll give you an example. I used it two weeks ago. 
if Samuel wouldn't have known the voice of God and had that experience, when he went to anoint a king, who would he anointed? One of the seven or eight, seven other brothers who came forward. Because his natural mind would have said, he's good. He's sh sharp. He talks well. He looks good. He's very strong. He's a warrior. He's, this, he's the next king for Israel. That's what he would have done. But because he had an experience that he knew the voice of God, nope, 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 looks good, sounds good, it's not the one. That's when he could say, Jesse, isn't there one more? Because I, what I, I'm operating on what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've touched. You see, he had a relationship with God. He knew God's voice. And because he knew God's voice, he could make the right decision. And Daniel could be, or not Daniel, but David could be brought from the backside of the desert and be anointed king. That's the difference. When we don't have experience with God, we will operate out of our flesh, even meaning well, and we would appoint a king from the other seven that we're not supposed to be. But because he knew the voice of God, we should only speak out of what we've experienced with God. Because too often, because this book is an alive book. This book is a real way, and he wants you to experience the same. He said, greater works will you do than even those who were around when I was here because I go to the Father to send what? The Holy Spirit. To, and what's he supposed to help you do? Be a witness. Amen. Amen. Be a witness of all that, all that has happened, all that has seen. Healings, miracles, salvations, multiplying bread and water, and all these wonderful things that he did. Wisdom and knowledge and what have you. That's what the Holy Spirit's about. Not just so that you and I can live a Christian life. It's in you and I can be witnesses, and we have to understand he sends those experiences to you and I so that we can share out of them, not just out of our head knowledge, out of our, you know, theory and so on, but out of our experience. I know this. You, you can say this, you can say that, but I know what God did for me. I know the day I saw that hand come out of my own car and spared us from head on with four people in the car and hit my hand and off the wheel. I'll never, you can never talk me out of that. I saw that hand. I experienced that. You know, and uh, when my glasses floated in the water on our honeymoon in North Carolina, when God did that, we said, Lord, you, you made the ax set float. I know what Jesus did for me. I needed my glasses to ride. You can never talk me out of that. He did. When God gives you those moments, you can say, I know what Jesus did for me. And he'll do the same. You're solidified in your heart and life and know that he's alive. It's not just a theory. He's not somebody that lost his power 2,000 years ago. He lost his ear. He's deaf now. He can't hear. He can't heal anymore. He can't. He's just up there watching us mess up. No, he's with you and I. And he's empowering us to do great works for him. That's his desire, to be a witnesses around the world. Today, Father, renew my witness. Renew your witness. Renew our witness. Because we need laborers in the harvest field. And that means witnesser. If I can use the word witnesses, <laughs> that's my own word. Witness, we need witnesses for Jesus Christ or witnesses for him. We have to define, I want, to take, I want us to take a moment here before we do go to, we have to define what is witnessing. I talked a little bit, it's really basically sharing from your experience. That's the greatest, that's the greatest person. You know how often when you say to somebody, when they're trying to sell you something or talk you into something, you'll say to them, even a doctor. They're, they're, you know, you're looking at surgery, you're looking at this, you're looking at that. And many times you'll say, when you're not sure what to do, you'll even ask and say, if this was your wife, or if this was your husband, if this was your child, yeah. what, what, what would you do as doctor? You know, what, what, what would you do for your child? What would you do? Many times you ask that because you want to hear from their experience. And they'll say, I'm not telling you what to do, but here's what I think I believe that I would do. Because this is what I've seen in my practice, or I've seen in my, over my life. So therefore, you'll make a decision a lot of times based on, because they're not just theory. This is what I've seen. This is what I've experienced. And this is what I would do. The same thing goes as Christians. We need to share what he's done for us. This is what I would do if I was you. I'd get on my knees right now. And I'd ask Jesus to be my Lord. And say, however you phrase that and so on. Whatever, whatever uh, depth of the conversation with the person. Because this is what I experienced when I was on my knees before the Lord and so on. You see... Christ wants us to be that penetrating power. We have to talk about a way. We'll talk about a way of life. But I want us to take, and I'd love to have somebody just lead us in prayer for two things. We've talked about it. I talked about it earlier here a little bit. But we need that scripture. It, it, I, I've never, and I've always heard it, and, and I've preached it probably three, four, five, six times. I don't know how many times in my life. But I've never felt the real need, the real, I can see what he's talking about. Send forth laborers. We have a dearth of laborers in the land. You know, when, when ministers, we get together and we talk about things, 30, 40 of us at a time. And that's a common theme. We never thought we'd see a day in time when we wouldn't have ministers, when there wouldn't be youth workers, yeah. 
when there wouldn't be children's workers, when there wouldn't be a worship leaders that you have to almost beg and plead and look and say, Lord, please, there's got to be somebody you're preparing for us and so on, whatever the case may be. I've no, and I, and uh, the reasons are many, I'm sure. There's all kinds of reasons. And, uh, but the bottom line is we need to pray because it is God who either raises up from the inside or brings from the outside, but it is God who calls them forth. And I don't know how he, he gets them to hear his call. Like Samuel, does he keep asking them? He asks them four times until finally Samuel heard from Eli, that's the Lord speaking. I tell him you're ready. But does he have to speak a fifth time, a sixth time, a seventh time to some people, young people, middle-aged, older folks, whatever? I don't, know what, I, don't know how, I don't know how it is, but somehow the word of the harvest is not being heard or he needs to speak it again to people. So I want us to take just two or three minutes right now before we go into the, the way of living a way of life and just pray for the harvest, number one. But it's ready. Pray for the harvest. But pray for harvesters and the one who's going to send laborers. Is there anybody who just lead us, just take two minutes, three minutes, just to lead us in prayer? I want us to disagree because we need to renew our witness as individuals and as a church. Is there anybody who would just lead in prayer for that this morning? I mean, I can, but if anybody else would just lead us in prayer for the heart. I hope you're Ben, if you would, please. Here, let me, excuse me, Ben. Let me just give you this microphone. We come to you, O oh Lord, because your word says, he that asketh, receiveth. So, Lord, we come in faith, and we follow your word, O oh God. The Father, according to your word that says we should pray, that the Lord of harvest will send laborers to his vineyard. We come as a church, and we stand on behalf of the church in the nation of the United States of America. And we ask, O oh God, that the field of America is ripe. We ask for laborers, Lord, laborers in your vineyard, laborers that you have sent, laborers that will obey your word, laborers that will stand, O oh God, and lead this uh, harvest in, in Jesus' name. We pray for ourselves. We bring ourselves, O oh Lord, before you. And we say, here we are, O oh Lord, send us. Send us. Father, by your spirit, anoint us. As you have anoint, as you anointed in time of old, men that you appointed and spoke to Moses for jobs that you have for them to do. We present ourselves as a church, as a church in the nation, as a church here in Southern Church. We present ourselves, every member, and we say, Lord, anoint us. Send us forth as laborers into your vineyard. We're not just praying for these laborers to come from thin air. We are praying for these laborers to come from us, your children. Lord, use us. Lord, anoint us by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fall upon us. Fall upon us, men and women, youth and children. Fall upon us. We yield ourselves to you, Lord. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. That we may be witnesses in this land, in this neighborhood. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I, I encourage us to continue to pray that. Thank you, Duane. We appreciate that. Just the background there. Pray that. There's, depending on what somebody's preaching on, there's always, there's two sides. There's one that used to, there's a phrase, and it's, it sounds wonderful, and it depends what group you're talking to, but it's, when it, he says, I want to be a witness for Jesus, and sometimes use words, meaning our lifestyle needs to line up with what the scripture says. Some people will verbalize it, but they won't live it. So, it's trying, so if you're talking to a crowd that's not living it, it, it needs to be, we need to, our life needs to line up with our words. On the other hand, there's people, and I think this is, the, this is more, this is happening a lot today. I don't know when this happened, but it happened that now we are, we are living, we're Christians. We're giving, our, we're giving our life to Christ, we're on our way to heaven, that's all good. But we're, we're either afraid 
in some cases maybe embarrassed others don't want to or we've abdicated to some oh they'll tell them they'll tell them Jesus said how will they go unless somebody is sent and how will they hear unless somebody speaks somewhere the word became flesh understand the word couldn't stay the word needed to become flesh to live among us you see somewhere on the line our Christian walk lives among people but has to be verbalized there's somewhere on the line you have to talk to your neighbor about Jesus somewhere on the line you have to talk to your children about Jesus not y yes live your life yes be a Christian in your life but there needs to be verbalization unless they hear they got to hear it from you so God can take those words and can penetrate remember that's penetration into their spirit and convict them of their sin or, or convince them that Jesus is the way somewhere along the line we have to verbalize yes it's a way of, we've got to live for Christ number one but number two we, we need to engage ultimately you may not the first day with somebody a neighbor or a co-worker but somewhere along the line whether they ask you if they ask you that's even better yet but if not you need to you need to think how can I how can I turn the conversation around to Jesus how can I turn it around and God will provide a way I've, I've testified this I'll never forget I'm not gonna go into the whole story but how God can turn eyes of people that an hour and a half before were ready to kill you I had eyes that were looking at me when I gave a plan of salvation at a funeral in New Jersey they wanted to kill me who is this punk talking about Jesus we have fancy cars we're sitting there with furs all the money in the world these are from the wealthiest people on the East Coast in New Egypt, New Jersey. And I was even asked to wear my best suit to come and do this. And it was a witch that was being buried. She was a witch. I mean, a, a, a Wiccan. And the Lord said, I want you to go. I want you to share me. And if the eyes of those people wanted to kill, I was like, I was actually shaking in my shoes. I didn't show it, but I was thinking, they're going to stand up any minute now and just say, get him out of here. We're done with this service. But I, I gave the plan of salvation quickly. And they still asked me to go to, the, to their uh, a country club so they could continue to brag about all their new condos, all their Coldwell Banker of the Year, Washington, D.C., sold $8 million worth of property, and all these people bragging, 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 trying to outdo each other. And I'm sitting there, Lord, I don't belong here. He says, yes, you do. I've called you here. That's why you belong here. And he said, you're going to have a chance to share me. Three hours after they were wanting to kill me with their eyes, all of a sudden Valentine's Day came up about love. And the Lord said, this is your opportunity now. After they've emptied themselves of all their riches, all their braggadociousness, if I can use that, that's my own word, <laughs> bragging and braggadociousness. <laughs> they emptied themselves. I asked them about love. And those same eyes that wanted to kill me three hours before started to cry. Tears coming down. I began to say about there was a God paid the penalty for our sins our misgivings and he requires nothing in return but just to offer ourselves I can't see anybody except the Christ here but I know this those same eyes I could have walked out of that funeral at time and said this and not said another word and I would have been dereliction of duty if I wouldn't have stayed because the Lord said I want you to stay you're going to get a moment to share me that they're going to hear you and those same 40 people that wanted to basically get him out of here I had their attention you could have heard a pin drop in that country club not because of me because the Lord said now share what I've done for you and what I've done for them and that was there was no altar call in that funeral home it was <laughs> but their hearts were open we have to be there live the life and then somewhere along the line whether it's three hours later whether it's three months later whether it's three weeks later it has to be verbalized it has to be verbalized. Somebody has to open their mouth and share what Jesus has done for you, what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. That's what causes people to go, I want that. I need that. I, I need that peace, that joy, that hope, that comfort, that guidance, and so on. You see, it's important. The word had to become flesh. Somewhere along the line, our working, who we are, needs to become verbalized. That's why I live this way. You got to share. Why do you do that? Why do you have the hope that lies in you? Why are you so happy in a difficult time when you don't know what's going on? Why are you so happy when you don't seem to have anything, when you only have Jesus? Let me share with you. Here's something else that has to happen now in our day and time for, for witnessing to become the witness that God, to our witness to be renewed as people, as a church, as the church. 
there needs to be a shift. A shift took place. Nobody meant bad by this, but there was a shift that took place somewhere in the last 400 years, 300 years, 200 years. I can look back to different things. I'm not sure what it was, but we shifted. And God is saying, my church has to get back to the New Testament form of witnessing. Get back to what worked well at first. It's a shift from personal to impersonal evangelism. Somewhere on the line, probably in the 40s, 50s, 30s, I don't know, or maybe even hundreds, a couple hundred years ago, it always was go into all the world and preach the gospel. That was to everybody. But then all of a sudden, we thought we'd come out on something that was better. We can do it in mass. Have mass crusades. Have a mass appeal. Just encourage people to come to a central location and have somebody give an appeal out. And it went from a personal invitation to, it went to a, a, a personal evangelism to impersonal evangelism, to the mass, like a large impersonal. And I'm not saying to discard mass evangelism. It still has its purpose. But mass, understand mass evangelism, the mass will not come to church, generally. Mass evangelism has done very little for the, for the church. Done very little. Personal evangelism works greater. And that's what we've, we've changed because personal evangelism means I have to open my mouth. It means I have to live the life and share. It takes more out of us. Mass is just going to come to mass and let, let the person up front or the person down front, whatever the place, it's on their shoulders then. We have to go back to the New Testament way. No, it's everybody. Andrew brought, brought Peter to Jesus. It's all about becoming Andrews and bringing Peters to Jesus. Because look what this guy's done for me. I want to bring you to this man in this case. Secondly, so we've got to get back to personal evangelism, not so much impersonal. Secondly, you know, we shifted from being people-centric, people-centric, people-centered, to church-centered evangelism. It used to be you'd bring Jesus, to people to Jesus wherever you were. Like in uh, New York City, that prayer, great prayer revival that took place in, in Wall Street and so on. It was personal. People came, gave their lives to Christ, began to pray and so on. It was personal. But now we say bring them to church. You see, it used to be go into all the world. Now it's, you know, uh, now come to here. It used to be go and tell. The Bible says go into all the world. You go tell. Live your life and share it. But now we've made it come and hear. Now, it has its place, but it's never as good as the personal. In other words, that should not replace the personal, but in the church it has. I think we're reaping those ramifications now as a church, whether it's for workers, whether it's for new converts, new uh, disciples, and so on. It says, go and make disciples. Don't bring them here, have them here, and be made. No, you go, Dan, and every one of us, go and make disciples. We're all called to do that. We're all called to live it, and we're all called to share it, and we're all called to be part of that process instead of, but we made it something that we, nobody meant evil by it. I don't think anybody meant evil by it. I thought it was a better way. But over time, you can see the results of something. And that's what studies are about. Well, we thought that was a, we thought it was, you know, uh, years ago, and in, 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 I'll just say this in medical profession, back in George Washington's day, you know, they believed that they'd cut you and drain out the poisons in your, in your blood and so on. They would, they, would, they would drain you and it would help. No, we found that wasn't the way to go. You learn things over time by experience and by looking back and saying, no, that wasn't, this is a better way and so on. We thought it was a better way by mass. But now we're going, you know what? It's okay to do that, but we can never let it substitute what the New Testament says. Everybody go into all your world. Live, your, live the life and teach and preach the gospel and make disciples. It's important because uh, you know, I said it earlier, the masses are not going to come to church. That's just, a general, that's just a general statement, especially in America. The masses are not going to come to church. And uh, so, therefore, we've got to go to them and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, and, uh, you know, there's a well-known, there was a well-known, few, this happened a few years ago, well-known uh, host on TV that cook, uh, cooking shows. And uh, he gave his life to Christ, but it was a process. His wife came to Christ first. And then over time, he said that his, his testimony was, and even on the show, he shared, it took a half hour sharing his testimony. It was a cooking show. He said, I, I began to read the red letters of the Bible because my wife had given her life to Jesus. And I wasn't sure or whatever. But he said, I did begin to read the red letter edition of the Bible and Jesus' words. And he said, over time, he gave his life to Christ. He realized that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. So what did he do? This is called a living witness. And that's what you and I need to be. He went, on, he went on one of his cooking shows, and he took the whole half-hour show for the most part, even while he was cooking. He shared, I apologize to everybody here that, for the language I've used on this show. 
I've apologized for some of the things that I said that were on the, or maybe on the, a little more on the filthy side, side that were a little crassy, whatever. I apologize for that because I should never have done that. God has changed my life. And so on. He took a whole half hour show to do that. Why, what I just called a living witness. He's a living witness, sharing what Jesus had done for him. He's changed my vocabulary. He's changed the way my head thinks, my heart thinks. He's changed who I am. I'm not the guy that I was, let's say three, I'm not sure, three, four, five, six months, whatever time it was between the salvation and the sharing on the show. I'm not that same guy, and I apologize for that. I repent of that, and I want you to realize that that's not going to happen on the show again, and so on and so forth. That's a living witness. He had to verbalize that. He, he could just went on teaching the show like always, but he knew in his heart there needed to be a verbalization of what happened on the inside of him, what Jesus did for him. I want to call us all back to verbalizing our faith. Every one of us, we need to live it absolutely. But there needs to be a verbalization with the people that you meet. You know, whether, whether, if you go to the same restaurant every day, ask yourself, have you ever really shared Jesus with the same guys or gals that you see every day for the last 20, 10 years, 20 years, 3 years, whatever? Have you ever had a moment to share Jesus with them? Did you do that? Same people you see at the water cooler every day, maybe at work or in, in, the, in the break room. Same people you see playing softball. You play softball with these, these guys, these 10, 15 gals and guys, whatever, for 10 years. Have you ever just said, guys, before we start there, after the game, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Have you ever somehow work it into the, the conversation? I mean, your bowling league, I don't know, whatever it may be, just your neighborhood uh, community center, and you get together for ice cream socials, I don't know, movie nights, whatever, you, all those things. Have you ever really somehow said, Lord, I need a platform sometime where I just share my faith? Yes. Guys, I love you. I've been with you for five years, but I would be derelict of duty if I didn't share with you yes. what Jesus did for me, yes. what he offers for you. Because I know some of you are hurting today. Because I know we, we just, it might be in a time when somebody lost somebody or there was a fire or there was where everybody's concerned about, let me share what he did for me during my fire or during my whatever it may be. And he'll do the same for you. Somewhere on the line saying, Lord, I need to verbalize my faith. Yes. Live it and verbalize it to those that you hang with on a fairly regular basis. And sometimes it's the first person, you, so it's the Good Samaritan. Sometimes it's just people that you, might be the first time he says, you need to share me with that person because today is going to be their last day on earth unless they receive my love. And I've shared it with you, you know, so many times I have two 357 shells, bullets in my possession. I have a third of them that's a 38 special of people that I never saw before. And the Lord said to me, go tell them. I'm getting gas. And he says, tell that person I love him and don't do what he's about to do. And they handed me the shell and broke down. I prayed with him. I said, no, you've got to promise me you're never going to do that. Promise me you will never do that because God, you know now God loves you and God cares for you. He knows who you are. He sent me here to get gas just to talk to you. Every one of us have people we have to verbalize. We have to verbalize. We have to verbalize. Those kind of things and in a grocery store, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's the first time, but usually it's those that you're around for a long time. And God, and you can only share what God has done for you. You can only share what God has done for you. I still think of my wife. She'll still say, Dan, you were crazy. One night at State Park, I got a call from a guy at about 1.30 in the morning. And uh, he wanted to see me in a state park right near here with no, no, no real lights on. He wanted to meet with me, and she said, Dan, you're crazy. I said, I got to go. She said, you're crazy. He could do anything. I said, I know he could. I went, and I came home with a 357. He gave me two of them. He had one for me, and he had one for him. Understand, God wants us to share Jesus. My wife and I still talk about it. She said, would you do that today? I said, I hope I would. I hope I would. Because after the fact, when he gave me, I go, oh, my goodness. It's, those are the things we've got to share Jesus. We have to verbalize it. We have to verbalize it. Somewhere along the line, we've got to verbalize our faith. Live it. Today in this place, I know we're Christians here. We love Jesus or we wouldn't even be here. I believe that with all my heart. It doesn't mean there isn't somebody here that needs Christ, but I believe most of us love Jesus and we wouldn't be here. But how are you? How am I? How are we with witnessing? The title of my message is Re Reignite Our Witness. Maybe it's for the first time or maybe it's to reignite. But our witness, we aren't saved just to be saved. We're saved to share and bring people to Christ and ultimately disciples to be made. So as we bring this to a close here today, I pray that our witness will be renewed. 
that our faith will be restored and that we will verbalize it. Because it's not enough to be kind to your neighbor. The only kind, it's, it's good to be kind. Because if you're only kind, that's a social gospel, but that doesn't save anybody. That doesn't make anybody a Christian. Only when they receive Christ as Savior. And he wants to use us in that process. And many times, you, somebody has to verbalize that. You may be the person just to set it up, and the next person may be the person to share. But we need to be part of that process. And always be mindful of that. Whatever group we're with, whether it's a group that loves us to death, or it's a group that doesn't like who you are. Doesn't like, whether, no matter who it is, it, we have to share Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, you know, I know I think of so many different people. You know, sometimes people work hospice. They're right with somebody who's ready for their past and going into eternity. Thank God. I know it's in, you, you have to be careful in, uh, with laws and regulations today. But there are those that like to work hospice just to be able to share Jesus when that person is, is passing. To, so they have entrance to heaven, to glory instead of something else. So it's important that we, but it has to be verbalized. So as we just close in prayer, just nobody pointing fingers at anybody, me to you, you to me. How are you with your witness? How am I with my witness? How are we with our witness? Have we, you know, how are we with the Holy Spirit? Has he filled us to be his witness? Are you filled to be his witness? Am I filled to be his witness? Am I being that? Let's just take a moment and just pray about that. And just, it, it's not for everybody to evaluate themselves. It's not for anybody to, you know, say I'm better than he is, she's better than I am. No. How are we? And just take a minute and talk to God about that. Because the laborers are few, but the harvest is ready. Father, we just reverently kneel in your presence, sit in your presence, wait in your presence. That song that like just goes through my head, there is no one like you. It just continues to go through my head. And no one can touch my heart like you do. And the reason you touch our hearts like you do is so that we can share that with others. So they can be touched like we were and ultimately become part of the family. God, sometimes we all mean to be witnesses, but sometimes we fall short. We get lazy, we get complacent, we get indifferent, we forget. Or we, or we condemn ourselves and say, well, I'm not perfect, so therefore I should keep my mouth shut. No, none of us are. We'll never get to where we're perfect to be able to, but you empower us to be your witness. So Lord, I pray that all excuses today that I have, that we make, it's too late, it's too early, it's too rainy, it's too sunny, it's not sunny enough. We make all kinds, I make all kinds, it's not the right time, it's not the right place. We make all kinds of reasons not to share. But God, I pray that those facades of those excuses will be tore down and we will be about the Great Commission. We will go into all the world. Where we will go and tell. We will go and be. Brothers Mary Joe even said to that five and six year old child, we will go and be and allow them to be part of a harvest of expanding your kingdom. Father, help us, Lord Jesus, that we would take our walk serious, our commission from you serious, the great commission serious, not just something we preach about and give us mental assent to and, and say uh, someone in Bible school will do that or somebody in uh, seminary will do that. But Lord, that we'll say no. As Isaiah said, Lord, if you can use me, send me. Send me. Send me. Father, that your church would grow and your church would explode with your presence. And where people will come to you ultimately by the droves because you want your house to be full, your kingdom to expand. And we know where you've placed your spirit in us to be. Your penetrating force, so to speak, penetrating the barrier of sin, strongholds that keep people bound, all the reasons that people say no to you. You want us to penetrate that barrier, those barriers, to break down those walls so that people can stand, so to speak, before you and realize who they are. They're lost, and they want you as their Savior. But this would be a year, God, I pray, of salvation, Lord, a year, God, of disciples being made for you around the world, but especially in America right now, and right here in Pennsylvania, right here in Northeast Pennsylvania. 
there will be a harvest, Lord. Your, your prophets keep saying there's going to be a harvest coming in Northeast PA is where it's going to start. Let it start with us, Lord. Let it start with us, Jesus. May your church explode and expand. Thank you for each person here today. Bless them abundantly, God. May we fulfill our assignment, our kingdom assignments that we've all been given. May we fulfill those for you. Bless each one we pray. Thank you for their attentiveness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, empower us. May we be your ambassadors. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we all said together, amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless you as you go, and may we just be his disciples and his witnesses. If I can, his wit a witness, may we be a good wit witness for Jesus Christ. But God bless you.